the way the Spirit brings life and blessing to the people of God, which is the plan, as foreshadowed in what we've been looking at today, it gets lost unless we consciously defend our life in the Spirit. It gets lost unless we consciously defend our life in fellowship with God by His Spirit. And what you end up then with is the nominal Christianity that's the biggest threat to Christianity in the world today. Unless we safeguard that life in the Spirit. In what specific ways does the Spirit bring the blessing without which biblical Christian experience is lost? We'll spend a bit of time going over it. Not now. <laughs> Lunch is precious. But in the coming weeks. What is essential to biblical Christianity is the work of the Spirit between redemption and consummation. What are the impacts then on the life of the genuine biblical Christian of the work of the Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit does a range of things. First of all, of course, he saves. Unless you're born again by the Spirit of God, there's no Christian life. You're dead in your sins. I mean, this is Nicodemus, isn't it? Jesus makes that very clear. But then what does he do? He empowers his people. Wait in Jerusalem till the Spirit comes on you. And Acts 1, you know, 8. That's what that's all about, isn't it? You wait till the Spirit comes. He empowers. He purifies. That's what Romans 8 is all about. No more the law, but the inside out purifying work of the Holy Spirit of God. He purifies. He reveals. He speaks today. He speaks through his word, of course, in the New Testament period. He speaks through his people today as God impresses upon us things that he wants said and done. It's crucial stuff. And he unites the genuine people of God. He unites the genuine people of God around his truth. But there's one more thing that impacts us and explains our situation, I'd say, particularly in Wales today, and we must grasp this. The presence of God the Spirit reflects the pleasure or the displeasure of God on a people. What I mean is this. A grieved spirit, and Isaiah 63 was telling us about that. A grieved spirit is evidence of a grievous people. Grievous to God. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit in whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. It's that important. If God has gone, said Isaiah, the only thing that sent him is sin. Rejecting him. Pushing him away. Falling short of the standard he made for you. And rebelling and rejecting him. And sin puts up that old wall between people and God. Which means he isn't going to be there to help you. But in this diagram in the slides, can you see there's a stairway going up over the top and across the cross and down, down the other way. The bad news is we all put our walls up against God because that is human nature. That's our nature even in Christ. To build walls to stop God getting at certain parts of our life. The good news is that Jesus builds stairs over that wall for us through the cross when we, one, turn from rebelling against him once and for all, and two, put our trust in him once and forever. And then every day. Then every day. And once you're linked up with God again, he's there to help you through all the challenges of life. And we have challenges in life, don't we? We have more challenges in life as professing Christians than we would if we were not professing Christians. Some days, I think. All the more reason then to guard our life in the Spirit because that's what he's there for. The one who comes alongside to help. <clears throat> you know, funnily enough, it was John Calvin who said that the essence of Christianity was the life of God in the soul of man. That's not the image we've got of him and it's an unfair image we've got in many ways. He's the guy who's saying you've got to safeguard this work of the Spirit of God in your soul or you're not living like a Christian. Because that's the Christian experience of the God who comes alongside to help. And if he's grieved, he will withdraw the comforter, his presence, 
as we experience his presence now in this third quarter of the game between redemption and consummation. So <coughs> what I want to do over the next number of weeks is look at this, I this issue. What, what is our experience of God supposed to be? And how do we make sure that our experience of God is maintained as it's supposed to be? What is the biblical Christian experience of God? It's easy to talk about the truth of God. And what we'll do is we'll be coming at our experience of God through the truth. Because that's the only way to be safe about this. If we come, I come at it through my experience, dictates my experience, then we're it's not only circular, it's potty and we're going to go off with the fairies. What is a biblical Christian experience of God? And it's my prayer that as we do that over the next few weeks, he will do for us those things that the Spirit does for God's people. And he'll keep us from that fifth one of grieving him that we don't want. And the reason I believe that to be a very important thing to do is that we are living in a world where this issue of maintaining this biblical experience of God by our life in the Spirit is being dangerously ignored and dangerously misunderstood. And we need to be a people who are different to what people see because what people see is a lie about God. What people see at the moment of what they think is the God squad is really not terribly credible. And because they only see that, they're having hard experience and saying, where is God? Where is your God? When I want him.